Hi, I'm Shanali Basak, Wall Street correspondent at Bloomberg News and Bloomberg Television. I'm being joined by Ken Molis, entrepreneur and investment banker. He's been everywhere, Drexel, DLJ, UBS, before founding Molis & Company, right before the last financial crisis, and then most recently, starting up a few SPACs. So thank you so much for joining us, Ken. Great to be with you. It's hard not to start with you with culture, just because you know, there's a record amount of deal making, yet people are still asking for so much flexibility. What do you tell people in this kind of environment and how much can you really change? Well, I don't know if you want to change. Uh, hopefully your culture is one that you don't want, you don't want to change. So I've, I've always thought the culture from the day I started 40 years ago that I've treated everybody around me with was a high level of trust, a high level of delegation. Uh, give people authority and give them some rope and hire, by the way, start with hiring smart people, but then give them a lot of authority and a lot of trust. And it's always stunning to me what they can accomplish. Um, and, and that was always our culture, not central, not bureaucratic, not top down. And so, look, when the crisis hit, um, it took us a second to figure out how we were going to do the technology. But I knew each individual, they they already had the responsibility, they already had um, the motivation, and, and they knew we trusted them. And I think coming back the other way, we're going to do it the same way. We're going to have um, our offices have been open. Uh, they are open as of now voluntarily. And we think people can make their own decisions. We actually trust our people. Uh, it's worked well. And they'll make their own decision as to uh, when and how many times they want to come back to the office. That's interesting. So are you saying that five days a week may not be the norm of the future anymore? Norm for who? Uh, it, it might be for me. Um, it might not be for someone else. Um, I think uh, it might improve people's work and people's, people's work could deteriorate. And it's up to us to let them know how we're seeing. Uh, and I think for different people, it will be different um, times. Uh, there is an importance, you know, the, the office is a good place. It is a place where you, I, I've been in a few times now, and the conversations you have with people, the creativity you have is much looser when you don't have to wait, you know, the pause of the second on uh, on delayed, uh, no matter how good this Zoom is. Um, but let people decide. I have a real, I have really high faith that our team, each one of them wants to be great, wants to service their clients uh, in the best way they can, and we'll find that way. And by the way, Shanali, I'm also open to the fact that generational things happen. I'm, I'm of, a, of a generation that that possibly a new generation of 30-year-old CEOs uh, will even be more comfortable doing it via Zoom, doing a meeting. And, and actually, so who, who am I to impose that on our client that they have to come into the office? So I think we're going to find out how things work, and, and then we'll be flexible enough to, to optimize around it. You have been given a lot of responsibility yourself when you were a young banker, and you've been really known to hire young people, bring them up. It's been so much of a part of your business model. The young people that work at Mullis & Company today, what may they be asking for that's different than before COVID? Well, probably, uh, you know, it's hard for us to see what's going on. So. You're right. Uh, one of the things that drove my career, I remember being a second or third year associate. We went to pitch a deal. It happened to be for a casino in Atlantic City. Bally's was building a Bally's. And we won the assignment. And the head of the firm, a guy named Fred Joseph, said, they, they said, we don't have anybody to do this deal, Fred. And he goes, oh, maybe we'll give it to Ken. I was fast asleep because I was that guy who was up two days doing the pitch. And a day later, he was about to give it to some uh, senior person, and I said, hey, Fred, I thought I, I thought I was going to lead this deal. I was probably 23 at the time. And he said, Ken, our first, our first job is to stay in business, um, meaning I didn't know how to do a deal. But long story short, I did end up leading the deal. Um, he let me do it. I learned more rereading an indenture start to finish than I ever did uh, over and over to get it right. Um, and, I, and I think those are the important that, – that's the important element of, of giving um, – people early responsibility and giving them more responsibility than they think they can handle. The, the difficulty right now is we're not there to see if they can't handle it or they need a little help. Look, I, I, I don't remember this 40 years ago. I'm sure I needed help. I'm sure I walked into an office and said, you know, what am I doing wrong here? Uh, that's the beauty of being near each other. I, I think it's harder to do on Zoom and it's harder to find those people 
who are having trouble and or or are overworked in their own homes. We just don't see them. So I want to shift gears a little because you have such a unique perspective here into what's happening with some of these big mean stocks. Mollis & Company has advised some of them, right? You've worked with AMC before. You've worked with Hertz. Your bankers have. So how has all of this crazy movement in the stock market changed the way you advise your clients? Well, first, it'll remind you that there is no one oracle that knows all the answers. I'll tell you... We were advising Hertz a year ago. Many of you remember it was uh, a deal that was uh, frowned upon. We tried to issue, uh, Hertz tried to issue equity in the bankruptcy. They had gone bankrupt and the stock was still trading 200 million shares a day at $4 a share, things like that. You know, And we said, well, why don't we just issue shares to finance? And, and if I remember the prospectus, it basically said, these shares are worth zero. We recommend you not buy them. And that didn't do anything to the stock. Um, the powers that be, I'm not sure exactly how they stopped it, but they stopped it. They made us stop. Interestingly, two interesting points about that. Hertz is about to come out of bankruptcy now. I think the stock is trading at six, seven dollars a share, which means the people we protected from themselves would have doubled or tripled their money. So sometimes the protector isn't really the protector. You know, that's why markets are so great. They're markets and people take risks. And the other thing that I think, just to, to say what I think is going on in the general meme stocks, is people are missing the social part of what's going on. I get asked all the time, are they, are they, are they dumb? Are they not doing the work? And, and I think they're just having fun. I think 70 to 80 percent of this is fun. Um, when you go to a casino, the most boisterous, loudest craps table is always the one where everybody runs over because somebody's made their point. They've predicted something. I'm going to make a hard six, and they make it three times in a row. Well, all of a sudden, half the casino's trying to put the money down on that table. I've, I've been there. I think 70 or 80% of the people there aren't making an investment decision. They're making an emotional, social decision. Let's go yell. Let's have fun. Um, I think on some of the mean stocks, I have my kids involved. You know, every half hour I get a rocket to the moon or an emoji or this one to the moon. I, I think you're in a global craps game where where everybody's talking to each other and they're having a blast. And then, by the way, you get to go home, the market shuts down, and you get to go to a bar. I understand you go to half of these bars and, and the meme stocks are half the conversation. So it's just a one, it's just a lot of it's fun. Now, at every crap table, there 70, 80 percent of the people are having fun and know they're gonna lose their money and accept it. And there is somebody who's going to lose their mortgage or try to hitchhike home or um, lose their college fund. It's sad. I, I think a lot of the meme stocks are, are people having fun and we, you know, don't don't analyze them. It's a social it, it's it's almost uh, it's almost what Roblox did, by the way. Not only do you have uh, the creation of gaming online where you can talk to each other, but you have multiple creators People, you know, Reddit and the boards, people are trying to create the next game. I understand there's a couple of new games starting this morning in the meme stock world. And so you have multiple players and you have multiple creators. I think they're having fun. Which is so funny, too, because we know your son also started a, um, a fintech company that focuses around investing in, in poker as well, though that's the saving side of things. You know, I do want to ask, though, because you were so early. In February, you told me that you were worried about leverage in the market. That was before Archegos. So what are you worried about now? At the end of any uh, cycle, leverage is the thing that usually takes people out. Um, it, because leverage makes you make the exact decision you don't want to make at the point you know you don't want to make it. And so uh, we run, as a, as a company, we run a debt-free model. We run a pretty cash-heavy uh, model. We have never had a piece of leverage on the firm from the day I started it. We've been through two crises. And instead of uh, reeling from those crises, I believe the firm accelerated because it was it, our firm is prepared. The model is prepared uh, for acceleration out of the cycle. And we're seeing that in COVID, too. I mean, not to, you know, COVID was a disaster uh, for people health-wise, but the business itself is in great shape and accelerating. Um, and, I, and I believe that has to do with your whole question, Sonali, about debt. Debt is, uh, debt is somebody else's ability to affect your business. At the exact moment, you want to be left alone. 
and um, and and that's when things surprise you, and uh, and you're not ready for it. Um, so it'll happen again. But Look, we'll cycle out of this, and it'll happen again. The Archegos will happen again. You mean? Or something like something that. Something like Arca I never would have guessed, by the way, would I have, I, I didn't see Archegos. It, it's funny. People are very creative. And they'll figure out a new way to hide leverage, use leverage. And I'm always one, again, I'm 40 years in the business. And when when something like an Archegos happens, you know, uh, or, you know, even when Madoff happened, I was one of those people who said, really? <laughs> I, really? That was going on? And um, so never underestimate people to devise a way to, to hide the risk they're taking. Because if you can hide the risk and just show the reward in a bull market, again, it's like that. Uh, pe people are paying a lot of attention to reward in a bull market. And so if you can hide a, a bit of how you're getting an excess reward, you'll get you'll get a lot of activity and a lot of focus on yourself. So, But it'll come out. What you're saying in this global craps game <laughs> of a stock market, are you worried that people are still individually taking on too much risk to play in this casino? No, I, you know, by the way, I was talking more to the meme stocks as a social event. I think, I think the rest of the market is usually a, um, a pretty rational market in which people are, I just say, I think the meme stocks have divested themselves from that. They just said, let's take these, these symbols and go off and just have fun. <laughs> And and um, I don't begrudge them that. I think it's uh, you know there's uh, why why not and um, and then and figure out your own game. It, I, look, I don't see the excess leverage in the stock market right now. I think people are being pretty. I think there was a buyout done yesterday. There's 50-50 equity and debt for the for private equity firms on a large deal. It doesn't feel excessive. And I have to say, the restructuring world. You know, we have a big restructuring team. Um, it's it's slowing down dramatically as capital is available, and people are replacing equity with uh, a debt with equity. Um, so again, I don't see it. I just wonder where it is. Could it be in places I don't see? Could it be deeply uh, in the crypto world? Could I just I just assume there's leverage lurking somewhere where I don't fully uh, I'm not fully able to see it. Well, since you bought us there, when it comes to crypto. How are you thinking about it? We just saw the first billion dollar deal happen in this space. Does it make sense for you to be either investing your own personal money in it or starting a business at Molus that starts to address cryptocurrency markets? You, you know, maybe on the personal side, definitely on the business side. We are focused on uh, having expertise and we do. Um, it's a big market. There's a lot of capital in there. There's a lot of uh, projects in the space. There's a lot of uh, people trying to make it, you know, improve the rails. So as I said, um, you know, it's like the, the gold rush of 1848. A lot of people didn't know if there was gold in the ground, but Levi's made a business selling jeans and Wells Fargo made a banking business selling banking. And, and I believe our business is selling the picks and the shovels. Um, so, you know, we, we, we have to know what people want, what picks and what shovels they need, what tools they need to be successful and try to provide them. Um, and, and then just watch the space and try to continue to learn. I'm, I'm, I'm willing, I'm trying to keep track of it and stay up to speed with it. And I wouldn't say I'm a total believer or total non-believer. So you've been on the cutting edge of some of these most recent kind of, um, you know, movements in the market, if you will. In crypto, you're talking about now mean stocks, but also SPACs. You have a bunch of your own, let alone Molus and Company advising on many deals. We've seen some pretty wonky deals lately, as well as some really big ones. If there's anything that investors should know about how this market is evolving, what would you say? Look, I think that we've gotten through this. In February and March, there might have been a feeling that a SPAC was a magic bean that turned a company worth X into a company worth 2X. It's just not true. It is a wonderful uh, mechanism to reverse engineer an IPO, to, to do the front end. Look, when I went public uh, in 2014, I had to put all my financials out and wait seven or eight months for the pricing. That's a long time to be exposed for an entrepreneur who, you know, your company secrets, your, your employees, your financials. The good news about a SPAC is it's reversed. You usually, you do your financials and your marketing in private and you announce when you've already orchestrated a deal and then you put that in the SEC for four or five months afterwards. That's much more comforting to somebody who's got big plans 
Um, and it costs a little more. Yes, I know uh, there are, are some of the TV announcers who harp on that. Yeah, it's more expensive, but I'll tell you, it, it might be worth it to get your deal locked up six or seven months earlier and know what your capital is and know what you have. Um, people will make that choice, and it will be volatile because the SPAC market is not an M&A market. It is really an IPO market. The, the entities that are coming through are entities that are going public in a sense. The When you say, let's say a, a SPAC we control buys a company, we really don't. We transfer our capital to those managers. They go off and, and run the company. Um, and with our capital, and we've taken them public in a virtual way, by the way, which I think is extremely exciting for boutique banks. We're, we're doing that without a trading floor without the billions of technology spend. Um, and it's it's really an unbelievable opportunity for a, a bank like us to, to participate in the capital markets in a, in a very big way. I can't let you leave us without also getting your global perspective here, Ken, because you're an investment bank that, like some others, has been looking into China. You yourself, your firm has advised, for example, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange when they tried to take over the London Stock Exchange. So. How do you think in this new era in the U.S. with President Biden in place, uh, the calculus will change when it comes to financial firms thinking about China, when people looking at deals involving Chinese firms? I, I think the a relationship with China will uh, change business in a very fundamental way over a, over you know a long period of time, five to ten years. I think if you look back 15 years ago, the emergence of China was all about, hey, how efficient can we make our product? And it was efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. Um, it was, uh, you know, if we can make the product uh, cheaper and ship it, uh, we can bring down pricing. And, you know, even uh, components of houses were being uh, made in China and shipped over here for the housing market. I think in the last few months with the uh, concerns about supply chain, and the speed to market, and I think it's even being led by Amazon, you know, same-day delivery, speed to market is becoming a much more higher uh, desire in the consumer's eye. And I think supply chain becomes a big issue. And as people focus, as companies focus on replacing efi efficiency with resiliency in their supply chain, we're going to see a dramatic move as to where people want to manufacture their products, meaning how resilient am I? If if there's a shutdown, if there's a blockage, if something were to happen in the world of politics, what happens to my supply chain? And we're going to see a real uh, build of, of resiliency uh, put in the system. And, and I think that's going to be just a trend that will have a big effect on the economy for the next five years. Well, yeah, what does this mean in terms of inflationary effects also? Are your clients preparing for something that could be more drastic than maybe some are counting for? Well, I do think you're seeing inflation, but I, I've, I've been a deflationist since the last crisis. I have to say, over time, I'm still a deflationist. The amount of, of uh, efficiency taken out by technology is just mind-boggling. Um, the fact that we're doing this conference um, the cost of you talking to me right now is probably in the micro pennies uh, versus me flying in last night, staying at a hotel, having dinner, uh, blah, 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 flying back. You know, I'd say we cut the cost down. And, and uh, for those watching, if anybody is, uh, thousands and thousands of people doing the same. So technology is an unbelievable deflationary force. Now, the supply chain problems that we're having and, and, and that will be re redone over time will result in things like lumber and items that we can find that are having supply chain problems jumping and appearing, I think, to to and, and, and could be actually show up in the numbers in a large spike in the short term because of that. But I'm still, um, my gut is that technology wins. And if anything, COVID accelerated technology, accelerated innovation around technology, and therefore, the surprise that might come out of all this is an acceleration in deflation once we get past the uh, supply chain um, bumps that, that look inflationary, and those are just shortages, I think. 